The Roman Imperial period is full of amazing characters. Trajan, Augustus, Aurelian. But how about the dozens of unremarkable, sometimes incompetent or straight up unlucky emperors? Today, we're looking at some of these unremarkable emperors. Between the years 282 and 285 AD, when Rome was dragging itself out from the horrible crisis of the 3rd century, the Karen dynasty quickly rose to power with the support of their soldiers, like so many before them, and as quickly as they rose to prominence, they fell into oblivion. Three emperors with mixed legacies, but hey, they left us some pretty interesting coins, so let's pay homage to the Karen dynasty by looking at some of their coins. Since a lot of you will be asking who the hell are these guys, before we look at their coins, let's get some historical perspective. It is September of the year 282 AD. The Empire is under the command of Emperor Probus, and things are starting to look better for Rome after Probus and Aurelian managed to defeat all external enemies and potential usurpers. Without many enemies to fight, and with way too many soldiers under his command, Probus makes the troops work throughout the Empire fixing and improving its infrastructure and helping its citizens restart the economy by draining marshes and planting vineyards, for example. This back-breaking, quote-unquote, unworthy job quickly started angering some of the soldiers. The circumstances behind the assassination of such a well-liked emperor like Probus are a matter of debate. The most popular theory on how the events turned, turned out is that a Praetorian prefect, Marcus Aurelius Numerius Carus, as he would be later known, exploited his influential position by enlisting the aid of a detachment of disgruntled soldiers, killing Probus when he was visiting the city of Sirmium. With Probus dead, and being one of the higher-ups in the Praetorian Guard, he managed to secure his position as emperor, starting the Karen dynasty. So, this is a a nice clue for the first coin of today. Let's look at a coin of Carus. For visual consistency and so we can see the slight differences on how each member of the family was shown on coins, all examples we'll be looking at today come from Western mints. In this case, Ticinum and Lugdunum. Carus reigned between 282 and 283, conducting successful military campaigns on the German frontier and pushing the Sassanians on the Far East as far as their capital, Tessiphon, which he managed to sack. It looked like he would turn out to be a good soldier emperor, despite having the negative marks of, well, killing off the previous emperor. But karma always strikes back. Carus had a quick and sudden death, which is still shrouded in mystery. Some sources say he was struck by lightning. Imagine how his soldiers would have seen this as a sign of the gods. Oh my god, Jupiter is angry at him. In any case, poisoning a well-executed murder or straight-up disease are probably the most likely causes. So for our coin here, this is a run-of-the-mill Antoninianus, the most common coin in circulation during the time. Pretty good-looking coin. Aurelian, another emperor, a decade or so, prior, reformed the coinage, greatly improving its quality. Notice, notice how interesting on his coins, the coins of Carus, I mean, we can see his receding hairline. While many emperors wanted to be depicted with a full head of hair, which was a symbol of virility in ancient times, Carus seems to have been more interested on making sure people actually knew what he looked like, even if that meant showing him with what would be considered a visual flaw. Why he was so sure of himself? Well, as we can see, he's, he's shown wearing a military cuirass, ready for battle, like, yeah, I want to see someone mock me and my balding head when I have thousands of angry soldiers by my side. I just dare you. As for the legends, we have the typical titles for the emperor. Imperator Carus, Pius Felix Augustus. On the reverse, we have the very common motif asking for unity among the commanders of the army, loyalty from the soldiers and the overall end of infighting. Generally, this is represented by Concordia, but here they chose Pax, Pax Exerciti, the peace amongst the army. So we have a goddess of peace holding on one hand this little olive branch, and on the other she holds a military standard. Under her, 
the letters P for the Prima workshop, so the first workshop of Picinum, and the Roman numerals 20 and 1, so the proportion of silver to copper, 20 to 1. This reverse gives us an interesting view on how the Romans saw certain concepts about life differently. For any of us, mixing Pax peace with a, with a militaristic message might sound very counterintuitive, but Romans used the image of Pax as for the peace that came after a military victory, the restoration of peace after a successful campaign. The ancient world was, after all, an incredibly violent place, and the imperial ethos dictated that Rome had a divine duty to maintain order through strength, first and foremost, strength. Very interesting and a nice reminder that throughout the centuries, one of the most important rules of politics or geopolitics was might makes right. Carus took his younger son, Nomerian, with him on his campaign against the Sassanians, so the troops could see the young Caesar and he could get some very needed military experience. The campaign, however, was cut short with the sudden death of Carus. Numerian was then elevated as emperor and forced to retreat by his troops, who saw the sudden death of the emperor as a bad omen. This example we have here, struck at Lugdunum between 283 and 284, depicts Numerian as Augustus, so it was made after Carus's death. Numerian died shortly after, on his way back to Rome, of some unknown disease, although, as always, the hypothesis of murder is always plausible. As we can see on the obverse, the portrait is very different from his father. Numerian was the junior co-emperor, and he was depicted as a young man without a beard. He wasn't that much younger than his brother, in fact. I mean, Carinus must have been 32, 33, and Numerian was around 28 when this coin was made. He could perfectly have had a beard, but in a way to distinguish each emperor, Numerian was shown without it. I really like the style of Lugdunum Mint. That's it's always it, it has these very elegant portraits we have here with very fine facial features. The legends, as always, spell spell out his new regnal name: Imperator Caesar Marcus Aurelius Numerianus Augustus. On the reverse, we have once more Pax. So I'm not going to expand much more on the meaning of this reverse. Although here Pax is depicted a little bit differently. Instead of the military banners, she holds a long scepter, as well as her typical olive branch, symbolizing peacetime. Notice that this time, the, the legends, it has two Gs at the end. Pax Augustorum, in the plural, obviously, because now the empire was under the rule of two men, both of Carus' sons. Before looking into Numerian's older brother, it's worth stopping and looking at the brief deification issue of coins that was made to honor Carus. By this time, it was quite common for emperors to be deified. It was a common move of the successors aiming to give them more legitimacy by being the son of a demigod of sorts. So, coins of the deified Carus show the emperor with the title Divo Caro. In some more interesting examples, we even see Divo Caro Partico, celebrating his victories against the Parthians, and on the reverse of these coins we find the typical motifs of an altar with flames on the top, likely the cremation ceremony, and some other instances feature the eagle, the symbol of Jupiter, the king of the gods, and because according to legends, the spirits of the deified heroes would be carried to the afterlife by the, this massive sacred eagle. For Carus's elder son, Carinus, I brought two coins today one as a Caesar and one as Augustus, in a joint reign with his brother. Let's first look at the example from 283, when he was still just a Caesar. Both examples from Carinus I have come from the Mint of Lugdunum, which is nice because it shows a subtle yet noticeable change in portraiture between them, between the issues as Caesar and as Emperor. So, for the issue as Caesar, we can see the bearded bust of Carinus, showing he was the elder son, Although, as an interesting touch, he seems to have shaved his chin. This is going to change on later issues. The Caesar wear his military cuirass, very common sight on coinage of the 3rd century, and some very straightforward legends proclaiming him as heir. 
Carinus Nobilicimus Caesar. Carinus, the most noble Caesar. Looking at the reverse, we continue the trend of the obverse of showing Carinus as this manly soldier emperor, just what the Romans needed at these times. We have Carinus himself holding the globe, symbolizing the world under Roman rule. He's wearing full battle armor and holds a spear. Virtus, the incarnation of manliness and military prowess, was also very commonly depicted like this. So it's, it's a very clear attempt to connect the emperor to the deity. The legends, Seculi Felicitas, translate to something akin to times of happiness, the generation when good life was restored. Good old imperial propaganda. Now we look at an issue of him as emperor. Very similar portrait, that's to be expected from a coin coming from the same mint just a few years later, but coins of Carinus as emperor show him with a full beard instead. Once more he wears a military cuirass, but now his name has changed to his full regnal name after inheriting the empire. Imperator Caesar Marcus Aurelius Carinus Augustus. It's funny to see how many 3rd century emperors adopt the name of emperors of the 2nd century, like Antoninus Pius or Marcus Aurelius, as a tool, yet another argument for gaining legitimacy, connecting themselves to the, the emperors of the golden days of the empire. As for the reverse in this piece, we have Equitas, Equitas Augustorum, the quality brought by the emperor with the goddess holding a cornucopia, the symbol of abundance, and a set of scales, symbolizing justice. Of course, Emperor Carinus did not care one bit about enforcing some sort of equality campaign amongst the citizenry. When we see equitas in these coins, the idea of equality here is more of the public order, of a stable social order that allows commerce to flow and people to... to operate in a market economy, make deals and resolve their grievances in a civil court. So just like the previous coin, this is a reassuring message, one of the return to the civilized Roman way of life throughout its territories. Apart from the coins of the three emperors of the current dynasty and the posthumous issues of Carus, if you want to delve really deep into this obscure reigning family, two other characters had coins struck on their names. At around 283-284, we have posthumous coins featuring a young boy named Nigrinianus. He was likely the son of Carinus, and he must have been around 8-9 at the time of his death. Carinus demanded his son was deified, and for a very short period of time on Nigrinian's name, coins were made at Rome, and these are very rare today. We also have coins from Carinus' spouse, well, one of his wives. Apparently, he had eight, nine wives throughout his life. This is Magnia Urbicia, and she was the mother of the young Nigrinian, and some rare coins on her name were also struck. Generally, they depict the empress with some very elaborate clothes, full of little dots, little details, like we see in this example up on the screen. Both Magnia and the Grinian are very hard to find, and they command quite a premium compared to coins of the Emperors, which are very affordable. With Carus being a bit more expensive than his sons. If you just get one example of the three Emperors, it's, it's really a very affordable dynasty to assemble a collection. I mean, it's just three characters. The Karen dynasty ended when Carinus, now without his father and without his brother, and without popular support in Rome due to his tyrannical nature, was deposed by a certain Diocletian, a general who took control of Numerian's troops after his death, pro proclaimed himself emperor, just marched into the empire. Diocletian would turn out to be a giant, a major character in late Roman history, and being so important, this short-lived dynasty of his predecessors ended up being a historical and numismatic footnote in history, overshadowed by their incredible successor. But hey, at least for us numismatists, the Karen dynasty left some pretty interesting coins, which are we get to enjoy today. So do you have a coin from the Karen dynasty? Let us know in the comment section down below. I hope you enjoyed this little episode, leave a like and consider subscribing if you did, Happy collecting, and I'll see you soon.